our trip to Indonesia was the last trip we made, and it was an opportunity to tie together some of the things we had learned in other countries, particularly regarding the influence of Buddhism and Hinduism on the arts and cultures of the countries throughout the Southeast Asian region. Indonesia is a huge country, spanning nearly 8,000 kilometers from east to west, and consists of more than 17,000 islands, of which more than 6,000 are inhabited. Within this huge country, there are more than 300 distinct ethnic groups and an estimated 600 different languages. With a population of 255 million people, Indonesia is the world's fourth largest country in terms of population. Java men are the remains of Homo erectus, found in what we now know as Indonesia, and shows that this region was inhabited as long as 1.5 million years ago, with our human ancestors, Homo sapiens, arriving nearly 45,000 years ago. Indonesia was strategically important for the international trade and links were created between India and China, and many other regions. This strategic trade location has influenced much of Indonesia's history, including its arts and culture. Hinduism and Buddhism arrived in the region nearly 1,800 years ago. By the 7th century, the Srivijaya Kingdom was exerting its influence over a large part of what we now call Indonesia, and extending into Malaysia and areas of Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and even the Philippines. Some of the greatest architectural feats of the era include the Buddhist Borobudur Temple and the Hindu Pramanan Temple, both of which were constructed well before the temples at Angkor, which in turn are based on the architecture of Srivijaya era. Selamat pagi. Welcome to Indonesia. If we see it from a contemporary point of view, like Indonesia now, in here, I mean, on Ham, we can see three aspects of culture that you can still see in Indonesia now. First is the cloth. That's the batik, like the one I'm wearing. This, this cloth is uh, made by a batik uh, dye prestige technique. And then you see the monster head over there, that's the Kala head. That's still around uh, uh, as part of Indonesian architectural uh, decorative design. So usually in entrance of, you can see in entrance of temples, but also in modern buildings and all that stuff. And the other one, the third one, is that little blade he holds. That is a version of Keris. Keris is also one of the Indonesian culture aspects that still, you know, lives on until now. While we were in Indonesia, we also had an opportunity to interview several editors of the Femina Group, a publisher of 14 magazines and the publisher of the first women's magazine in Indonesia, Femina, which was launched in 1972. We discussed several topics including the responsibility publishers have toward the shaping of a country's society, as well as the changing role of women in modern society. I think that the publishing industry has a very big impact on teenagers, especially in Indonesia, because aside from the school, and the family, that is one of the main source of information they get. That's why we try to, to make our magazine fun, but not only that, also informative, but the most important thing is also educative. Uh, I think they are still struggling to adapt with the Western issues. Yeah. Uh, they get because a lot of information, a lot of fashion style is inspired by the Western celebrities. <coughs> but in other ways, there are still some cultural boundaries that um, actually uh, sometimes clash clash between the Western cultures and the 
in the culture. Most Western, I thought American style is tend to be very open. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, Indonesia is a Muslim country, and we cannot just take the trends like that. And it makes actually Indonesian teens more creative because, of course, they have to make uh, to have to find a solution to look stylish but still uh, have a norm. Uh, yeah, have a norm, norm. and um, <coughs> look Indonesian. That's why the hijab. Uh, Hijabers, Hijabers. Hijabers. community here is pretty big because it, it is one of the uh, community that looks uh, stylish but still Indonesian. <laughs> Indonesia is a Muslim country. Ninety percent of our people is uh, are Muslim, so of course uh, religion have a very strong influence. I think in all most. Uh, aspects of life here, mm -hmm. including the teenagers. There are strong influence also coming from Western contemporary culture. Mm -hmm. But uh, I see that the teenagers are struggling to find ways between those two. And again, hijabers community, I think that's the best example I can give you about uh, creative mm -hmm. solution, how people manage to find balance between those two. Okay, uh, I personally think that uh, the role of Indonesian woman now has shifted a bit because maybe in my mom generation it was seventies. Seventies. Yeah, uh, in the role of Indonesian woman is housewife, of course. They give birth and live curry, in, yeah, live, live in, uh, live their in house the house after they uh, graduate or sometimes they don't even go to university. But now most uh, women has pursued their career. That's also happened in uh, the teenagers, for example, our readers. Now uh, the the will the willingness to pursue the, their career are higher. Uh, back then, I think at least thirty percent are still wanted to get married after they graduate high school but now they tend to have uh, to go to the to university college. first <coughs> yes. and then uh, go to the uh, or get a job first before uh, considering getting married we tend to use indonesian word to keep the local culture. That's why you also see in our cover we never put any foreigner models uh, as our cover because we would like to keep Indonesian girls as our face of magazine. In our magazine we downsize the, the using of English because now in, te in other teenage girl magazine you put mixed language between English yeah. and Indonesia but our magazine I can say for sure that we are the most uh, committed to keep our language as um, the main language in the magazine. Of course the chances are not as big as the men here but I think that happens in any other areas in the, in the whole world. But uh, yeah, yes, there are uh, women who try to make way into politics. One of the example of the great leader in politics, I think Ibu Risma, is the governor of Surabaya. Uh, she is one of the is it Times or something? Yeah. Time, the most influenced leader uh, in Time magazine just featured because she ruled uh, Surabaya and. There are a lot of changing uh, changes happening in the city uh, during her governance. Yes, you you can be let's say you, let's let's say Burisma. You can be an, a governor of Surabaya, but of course, people will also look at her as a mother, as a housewife. How how does she deal with her personal life? Because then uh, people, Indonesian uh, also thinks that you still have to fill your responsibilities there in the domestic area. That's why um, it, I think it's quite a challenge and the, the, um, 
the demand is quite high so you have to be become you have to become a superwoman little piggy this is what we call celengan celengan is from celeng celeng means pig so when we say celengan it literally means piggy bank okay. and this is from the majapahit era and we found it in different sizes and so you can imagine how the civilization has already really developed they already have the uh, they already developed the habit of saving money Due to its geography with more than 17,000 islands, Indonesia faces many challenges in communicating with people across its huge territory. When satellites were first developed, Indonesia quickly realized the possibilities of this technology and in 1925 launched its first telecommunication satellite. We had an opportunity to speak with Dr. Ad Maji about satellites and the satellite industry and their importance to Indonesia's telecommunication infrastructure. Indonesia was uh, developing uh, its infrastructure coming up from different technology. We know that initially we have like a landline technology before there is no satellite technology available. Uh, all the communication telephone are built based on a plan line, uh, wireline technology, that is uh, what they call it. But starting on 75, Indonesia has launched uh, the first, uh, I think not not worldwide, this is like the third, the third country will launch a satellite to cover the country with telecommunication services like television, uh, telephone connection. So uh, starting from 75, there are different paths to cover the services. Some are using terrestrial, what we call terrestrial, is wireline connection. At the same time, we launch Indonesia launch uh, what we call satellite services. Using satellite, as you already know, that we have like a big bird in the sky. We will repeat the information that we want to send or receive from Jakarta or from big cities to other places in Indonesia. In 75, uh, people in Indonesia, not all of them can enjoy the, let's say, television. So as a national interest, Indonesia has to promote uh, its uh, languages, cultures, to make, uh, to integrate the outermost part of uh, the country into a single understanding what the country really is. So uh, education, cultural uh, understanding and plain communication is really something which is very, very essential to, to building Indonesia at the moment. People speaking Bahasa Indonesia that is something that cannot be done earlier because there is no way to to send pictures, to send uh, uh, information to outermost uh, islands in Indonesia. Two thousand and five and uh, onward, government built what they call it the uh, internet on villages. They built a small kiosk where people can come there, uh, open the internet, uh, accessing information and uh, sending messages, receiving messages. Maybe as we know that the internet is, internet speed is growing uh, very quick. In the old days, people are satisfied with the speed of only couple of kbps but now as uh, everybody is carrying their own gadgets and opening youtubes opening facebooks and opening uh, plain internet bandwidth is not enough the arrival of broadband technology will enable people in not only in the big cities but all these small villages can have uh, equal access to that technology
that's the future. I think uh, IP star was the first uh, satellite, protein satellite, which uh, cover this region. Uh, no other satellite, protein satellite, has been launched to deliver that kind of services before. Then I think everybody is commercially agree that there's no other option other than delivering it using broadband internet. There is a trend that uh, all regions are not converging into one one places. Now we see that ASEAN when people are exchanging goods and services. By goods and services, we also talking about the means to get there. I mean, uh, when you do a transaction online, you do like uh, e-commerce, you do like buying online, have your uh, messages across different member of the countries in the region, then uh, the connection in the region is a necessity. You you don't need to go through national border just to get connected to somebody else in, in other places in the, in the region. Maybe somebody can produce something there and at the same time connected to a client in other country, which will make the economy work in a much faster way. Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world, yet geographically it is situated far from the origins of Islam, the Middle East. Even so, Jakarta is home to largest mosque in Southeast Asia, built to commemorate Indonesia's independence. Hence the mosque name is Tiko, which in Arabic means independence. This is uh, the biggest mosque in Asia. Eh? And then it's uh, the second biggest in the world, up to Mecca, Saudi Arabia. And then uh, inside the mosque, there is uh, the biggest drum in the world. And then so you can look, there is uh, one, two, three, four, five floors. That is the symbol because the Muslim prayer five times a day. The capacity of uh, this mosque, since uh, outside, inside, downstairs, main lobby, until five floors, minimal 200,000 people. As we were looking at regional history and the influence of Indonesia's history on the region, we had an opportunity to visit the National Museum of Indonesia. The museum is one of the finest museums in Southeast Asia. To give us an overview of Indonesia's history, culture, and arts, we spoke with Indonesian archaeologist Anissa Kautum. religion, um, Hindu Buddhist. The older version of Hindu, which is the Veda Hindu, uh, actually came in from the earlier part of the century, as um, early as the 4th century, uh, as we see in the, the Yupa inscription found in East Borneo. Uh, but Buddhist, Buddhism also come in, uh, not far from that. We can uh, know it from remains of uh, stupa structures in West Java that um, dated from as early as the 5th, 5th century as part of the Tarumanagara uh, kingdom at the time. The later version of Hindu with what we saw in Central Java, uh, it started to blossom around the 8th, so from what we saw from the artifacts, the 8th until around the 11th century then uh, it shows a little bit um, development when it moved from around 13th century to 15th in, in East Java. So it's showing a little bit more variation of the Hinduism and also the Buddhism. There's a lot of local um, beliefs that, you know, um, colored the, the, the religion. So it shows different kind of form of art or different kind of minor deities and all that stuff. For the Islam, the Islamic Kingdom started to rise uh, from 14 to 15 from Aceh and north point of Sumatra. It was actually brought by the traders and the merchants along with the merchants from China. 
in India. And some part of them uh, start to live in Indonesia, mix with Indonesia. They, uh, they even, some adapt with the local custom, like in Bima. Bima is in Sumbawa, the Nisambora. They have this sarong that they use for daily, daily wear. When the Muslim come, and you know, with the hijab regulation and stuff, so they adapt by using the sarong on to how to wear the hijab. So there's a disconnection between Hindu Buddhist era and then the Muslim era. So if people come here and then see the museum, so where's the, you know, the identity of Indonesia as the largest Muslim country, uh, uh, you know, in the world. But um, the thing is, uh, we had a, the, the story of Hindu Buddhism in our country is from the 4th century until the 13th century. And <laughs> there's uh, like three and a half century of, you know, colonialization and everything and it was just all wiped out. So there's that whole systemize of, you know, this connection from the, from the previous history. In Cambodia, in Thailand, and in other Southeast Asia, you will find a lot of Karuda and all of this Ramayana or Vishnu kind of theme either in the sculpture or in the, on the art, the architecture. And sometimes it's not always in the Hindu uh, buildings, but also in Buddhist buildings. Because there is this kind of um, understanding of leadership philosophy from Rama, that uh, Thai, Thai kings always have the, you know, the, the Rama something or Rama something or a version of Rama name. So there's a philosophy of leadership from Rama that is uh, supposed to be understood by all leaders, either Hindu or Buddhist. And this Ramayana theme is one of the evidence that we see. One of the significant influences are the Hindu Buddhist era, which spans from 4th to 14th century, so that's a 10 centuries of you know, period of Hindu Buddhist um, development, uh, and it influenced almost every part of our culture, even now. Even though the religion changed, the political change, the kingdoms already passed away, but we can still see it in our culture, either in architecture or even in some localized tradition, like how to give respect to the death or for babies and all that stuff. So Ramayana and Mahabharata are the two main big stories coming in from uh, coming in from India, and that came in with the religion because that's not just a that's not just a fable at the time. That's also part of the belief, part of the philosophy, the way of life, and then. Uh, so Ramayana is the story of King Rama um, that, uh, that tries to take back uh, his wife Shin Sinta uh, by the help of the monkeys and, and then Mahabharata is the story about you know heroism, how, how to deal with family conflict, civil war and, and all that stuff. So all of these philosophies uh, uh, maintains in the in the in the region not just on the religious side or the art side but becomes you know daily kind of understanding even though like if I'm a, I'm a Muslim but the story of the love story between Rama and Sinta the loyalty and everything that becomes inspiration for today's generation or uh, the bravery of, uh, of Hanuman and his uh, his monkeys and that's also become a wonderful stories for the kids uh, and how you can work together as a team as a group you know and yeah there's this there's those spirits and also about the brotherhood of Pandawa in Mahabharata that's also becoming a, a, a daily a daily story of you know how we can get the uh, how we can understand and him and him um, and understand and then practice these values with our brothers, with our families. How can we uh, evade, 
you know, conflicts and how can we really just, you know, get along. Ramayana, you can see, uh, I already showed you guys, it's, you can see it on the sculptures and everything. And then there's our aspects of the Ramayana story, we can still show pop up and different part of the contemporary architecture, either the dragon, either the Garuda, I mean the, the, the symbol of Indonesia, the country, is the Garuda. So uh, that shows, you know, uh, you know, we don't realize it, we, but it's still part of our identity. Sriwijaya Empire span from 6 to 13 and it's included uh, like Java, maybe like West part Java and Sumatra and then the Malay Peninsula up to Thailand. It was a Buddhist uh, kingdom. It was the center of the trade in the interior part of South Sumatra. It's in Jambi. It's 6,300 hectare wide of complex of school, residence, and trade centers, all from bricks. So imagine at that time, we have a complex of university larger from universities in your country or in my country. So, and that because the, that supported by the whole international trade of the silk trade, but through the maritime, uh, ma uh, maritime route. My name is Sim, and today we are in Indonesia. My favorite, the most favorite thing in Jogata is <clears throat> the mas the mascot that I saw it in the monument because they, they look really nice and look very traditional and cultural. The thing I like the most probably be walking about stuff because I can see a lot of things. What is in Jakarta about? I like the mosque because inside I can see the ceremonies of the religious and the tour guide that guide us into the mosque explain very well what about the mosque. I like the old town because it looks nice and it's, it looks a little bit modern.